Welcome back. In this section, what we're going to be doing is adding a couple of forms for our customer info and our financial info panes and start to populate it with data. Now, even when I'm doing training information, training courses and uh, testing uh, the app designer, I like to sketch out what my form is going to actually look like uh, and also to start to identify where the data is going to come from. Um, so what you'll find here, I've done that. Uh, just scribbled it out. Here's our customer info pane um, with our fields. And I'm just saying all the data is going to come from ARS, QRY, business object, and it's going to be the header element. Here's our financial info pane. Um, and we can see that the data is going to be coming from a couple of places, the header element from a a ARS, QRY, and then the total section. And I also want um, two sections here which are going to be collapsible group headings um, so that's how my form is going to behave and then I've got a little bit of uh, business logic here um, so when I'm going to get my data all the data for this form from ARS QRY um, and when the customer uh, combo changes then I want to execute uh, whatever mechanism I'm going to do to get the uh, data and then populate the form. Now, I know that's fairly trivial, um, but you get the general idea. Now, if you are doing specifications for customers or indeed internal systems, then you might even use uh, App Designer itself to to design the forms to go into your own formal specification to present to somebody to say, is this what you want me to write? Is it, is, is it going to behave correctly? It is vitally important in my view for you to make sure that you get commitment from whoever you're writing it for that what you are about to produce is what they actually want. Um, and uh, I'm sure we've all been in a position where you delivered something and it isn't quite what the uh, end user was was uh, expecting. Anyway, enough of that. Let's get cracking with um, uh, our app designer um, and see where we go from here. Here I am back in app designer and we're just about to load our application. So uh, I'm going to do it through the open option here and just scroll down. Um, now we were working on TRNCQ1. Um, I've actually made a copy for us to continue with. Um, just to remind you that to make a copy, we highlight the app, press the copy button up here. It'll ask for a new application name, a new application title, and hey presto, we have our new copy. Now, when I'm actually uh, developing or testing uh, applications, I'll often make copies as I'm going along because I like to have a, a, a point where I know something works and if I mess things up, then I can go back to that. Just to remind you again that if you ever want to delete a copy or an app, just highlight it, press the delete button on your keyboard. You'll get an option to whether you want to delete it or not, uh, yes or no, and away you go. So that's how we would handle that. So I'm just going to double click my uh, application here. And um, here we go. So the first thing that we actually want to do is wire up the help. Um, so when we press the help button, I'd like uh, a pane or a window to appear on top of the app with some text on it explaining what the actual app does. So the easiest way to do that is to add a notepad control. So I've just clicked the notepad control here and you see that it's created its own pane um, and uh, title of notepad. So what we'll do is we'll change that for the time being. Let's call this help text, something like that. Now to get a pane appearing on top of the application, um, it's uh, known as a dialog box or a modal box if you are using other programming languages. So we need to check this um, option here. Um, if we don't do that, then it will just be seen as a, a different uh, pane alongside the form ones that we're going to add a little bit later on. Um, whilst we're here, just to remind you or just to note, tell you, if you ever add a pane you want to get rid of, there's the delete pane option there um, in the pane properties of the pane you want to delete. Um, clicking that will give me an option to delete the pane or not. Simply checking this close button will just simply close the pane as it does in the rest of Cispro. It will not delete the pane. It will disappear, but it won't delete it. So that's the that's the key if you add it. Um, sometimes if I'm over enthusiastic, I'll double click one of these controls and you'll get two panes appearing. So that's uh, uh, quite useful. So first of all, we need to actually add some text. So let's put something in here. Um, I've got some text I've already typed in. Um, let me make that bold, say. 
you get the general idea. You type as much of it uh, as you like. Now, there are a couple of other things that we need to do here. Um, first of all, we need to tell App Designer that this is static information and we wanted to keep it. And um, the way we do that is on this option here, save notepad context when designing, which will check that. If we don't do that, then App Designer assumes that um, when the app runs, we are going to be typing information into the notepad. So it's not going to save whatever we type in here now. And we also want to make it read only um, just because we don't want people typing on it. So that's set up our um, help text. So uh, next thing to do is to wire up um, uh, the display of this pane when we press this button here. But before I want to do that, I want you to, sh to have a quick look at Application Explorer. This is an explorer that is a, a, um, uh, displaying all the controls. We'll just press refresh so that we've got the latest. And if we start to expand our application, We'll see here that this is our uh, top level um, application. This is our toolbar. There's our file, our clothes, our customer. These are the type of buttons. You, if I just expand that a little bit, bear with me whilst we get that there. So pop up button, combo, so on like that. These are the event IDs that they're doing here. And this is our notepad. So you can actually see your application being designed uh, in the application designer. And if you double click on any of these, you'll go straight through to um, the editor um, to edit that, that control. So, OK, what we will do now is nip back into um, our VB script. And here we are back in our VB script. Just to remind you, remember, we set up some constants to uh, uh, represent the event IDs as the T-bar help constant. Um, here's our select statement. So when the help button is pressed, 01003 is going to hit this um, on user event. So we'll get rid of the message box. And what we want to do now is show a dialog box. Um, and we will find this here. And if we double click this, we'll see that our help text pane is in a list here. Now, what our app design has actually done uh, when we clicked on that is nipped around the panes looking for any dialog boxes um, and display them in this text. Now, quite a common mistake, and I make it regularly, is I forget to check the, di the dialog pane uh, box. And when I get here and I click on this, there's nothing in this list. And it's simply a matter of going back to the designer putting a check mark on the dialog and it will appear here. And then we just select this pane and in goes the code. So we can see now what's happening. It's calling a SysPro function. This is a VB script wrapper um, that uh, app designer knows about. It's passing us the show dialog constant. So it's now telling it which uh, call out to run and it's giving it the pane ID or pane name um, for it to do that. And that's all we actually have to do. So if we actually save this, and run our app. Great, so uh, nothing actually changed and, and more importantly, our uh, con notepad control hasn't appeared suddenly on our form. And if we just press um, our help, up it pops. So that's our first step of getting our, our app going. So we'll move on now to add the forms and uh, sort out data and things like that. But before we do that, I just want to show you a little trick with the, the help button and the calling of our help text. Um, if we, uh, we need to edit the properties of the help button. So typically we would press edit application details and go to design toolbar. But you'll soon realize that if all I've got to do is click on the button, an app designer will take you straight through to the properties of the button. There's our caption. There's our event ID 1003, which was going through to our VB script. And then we caught it and we did a call out to show the dialog box. But if we go a little bit further down here, we will see there's an option called show dialog box. And in this combo here, there is a list of all the dialog boxes in the app, just as there was in the VB script. And if we select that, then what will happen is that app designer will automatically show the dialog box without having to write any VB script at all. 
So let's nip into our VB script and just tidy that up. So you'll notice here already I've knocked out the constant for the close button um, and the logic for calling the close app function because we added uh, the exit button earlier on. We will comment out that constant and the check for that. We'll also just need to knock out this um, catch all because it will get an erroneous error message irrespective of the fact that it will be uh, calling a dialog box it will still be calling this event and passing um, the event id in here so if we were um, not aware of it then it, then it would throw that error message so there we go a um, little bit of a tidy up and now all we've got to do is run our app Oh, here we are. Um, and if I just press the help button, up comes our help text without any VB script at all, which is great. Um, and just to draw your attention to, I uh, removed the, the close button because we'd knocked out all that code and we just got our exit button. Uh, remember, we just simply said it was event ID 60,000 and A press, so it closes the app. So we're in a good place. We've knocked out a chunk of VB script we didn't need. Um, App designer is doing quite a lot of code and we'll move on now to start adding the forms. Before I go charging off showing you how to uh, create forms and populate them with data, we do need to have a discussion about the different ways that app designer can get data. Now, there is a completely separate course on data handling, um, which goes into this in great depth. And I am conscious that this is a getting started course, but I do need to put this into context so that you get the right concepts right at the beginning. Um, there are two primary methods. Um, the first in App Designer is the creation of App Designer data sources. Now, these data sources can be created for running business objects or uh, external SQL statements on um, SQL databases or OLEDB or ODBC databases. It doesn't matter uh, what the target uh, database is. Um, and these can be executed by the App Designer app automatically and uh, in doing so can populate forms and list views automatically for you. Now, this is actually quite important because it removes the necessity for writing great swathes of VB script um, and uh, makes it an awful lot easier to create uh, applications. Um, I've made the note here, though, that you can also execute data sources in VB script as well, and we may get a chance to do that a little bit later on. Um, obviously, um, the main or the, probably the most commonly used uh, for a method used by those people who are used to custom panes is to run the business object in a VB script um, and get the XML back and process the XML. Um, you can uh, run data sources in a similar way, which I've just mentioned earlier on. And clearly, uh, you can run ADO, DB, SQL statements, and process the results uh, in your VB script. Um, having done that in the VB script, though, one would typically expect you to be populating the forms and list views within your code. Um, so uh, in the drive for low code, no code, um, this is why CISPRO have introduced the data sources because an awful lot of this heavy lifting um, is actually done for you. Uh, but there may be instances where you don't want the automation or you've got to do some extra processing before you can actually populate the forms. So what we're going to be doing now is focusing on creating the forms using data sources. And um, if we get a chance, we will come back um, and have a look at uh, this, doing the same, but through a VB script. Well, here we are back in our app. Um, as we did before, I have made a copy um, and we've called it TRNCQ3 so we can tinker around with data sources. If you remember from our spec, our data was coming from the ARSQRY business object and we wanted information from the header element and the totals uh, element. So we need to create two data sources. So we go up here to the data source button, press data source. Um, and we've got this little form here. Uh, there's no data source is yet defined, so we will simply say that we want to add a query data source. Um, and it's now asking us for a data source name. So we, what we will do is we'll go something like customer header. 
Um, it's going to be a business object we want to use. We know it's ARSQR or ARSQRY, and we but we could browse on that. Um, now, for those of you who are familiar with using business objects, possibly in customized panes uh, and things like that, you'll know that you can edit the XML in to reduce the amount of data. Um, I'm not going to do that uh, here. We cover that more in the full full blown data source uh, course. Um, and what we need to do now is basically select the node that we want this data source to return. Um, and it's the header. So we click here and you'll see all the elements that the header uh, um, node will, will return. And there's our address and things which we wanted. So that's great. So we've got the right uh, node. So we just say select that node and we see it going in here. And that's all we've got to do. So we just simply save that and we'll create a customer total. It's going to be the business object. So it's going to be RSQRY again. Then we won't bother with that. We will select that. We'll go down to the total section here. And we can see the R306090, which you wanted. We basically select the XML node there, um, save it, and close that. And we can now start to see um, all the business, the data sources rather that we are, are um, creating as we go along. If we ever want to edit one, we just simply click on it. Um, and if you want to delete it, you just basically highlight it um, and delete it. OK, so that's looking good. So what we'll do now is we'll go down and start to add our forms um, and link up our data sources with our forms. So to add a form, we simply go to the toolbox. Um, we click a form. It's uh, added the form for us. We start off by changing the title. We'll call it customer info. Bit of a warning there, but that don't, doesn't worry us. That's really for the main Cispro developers when they're doing the core product. Um, and now we have our form. I'm going to leave um, all these options uh, as default. Just reminding you that if you happen to double click form, you can delete the pane here. Um, and uh, what we've got to do now is add the fields on our form. Now, because we've created data sources, we can select the fields from the data source. So uh, here are those, there's our customer header. We we'll select customer header. And what it's popped up now is all the elements in the customer header node. And it's saying, which ones of these do we want on our um, uh, app or our, on our form? So we have a quick look at our spec. We want the name. Sold to address one, two, three, four, five, and postcode, I think. Um, then we want to go down here looking for contact. Telephone. Email. Customer on hold, there it is. Okay, so we'll, uh, all we've got to do now, now, now we've selected those, we just simply say add selected items. And you can see there that they've added. We can nip back here and add some more if you wanted to or take them off. Um, so now that we've actually got the uh, form built, if we just have a quick look at some of these, so we'll just pick up on the name to begin with. See there's a tab here called form field properties, go over here. Caption is name, name, and in the field binding here, we can see there's the data source name followed by the element name. And what this is saying to us is that this field will be populated from that data source when the data source is executed. Now, this uh, help text is getting in the way a little bit, so we'll um, move it out of the way like you do with a normal um, CISPRO. Um, oops, what have I done now? the normal CISPRO um, panes. Um, in fact, what we could do is probably just auto hide it. It will just be lurking down here. So um, what we've got now is our form. We've got our fields uh, bound in here. If we have a look at something like this, though, we'll see that 
We go to the field properties. Sold to address caption is going to sold to the address. The captions don't have to match the elements. So we might well say that this is um, address line one as an example. You can change the uh, whatever you want in here. You could leave them blank if you wanted to and just have the address block uh, coming in here. OK, so you get the general idea. But what we've got to do now is tell the app um, when to execute that data source. And we do that from um, the toolbar because we want it to execute this data source when the customer number changes. So we go uh, back to edit application details. We go to design toolbar. And if we click on here, we see our combo box. And if we scroll down here a little bit, it says data sources to execute. Um, so we do this and basically what this is saying is we want to execute this the customer header business object when the um, customer number changes so we can see the source so we can we can run multiple ones which we will be doing in a short while so basically what we've got now is we've got a form with our fields on it each field knows where the data is coming from it um, and the data source knows when it's going to be executed so what we'll do now is we will run our application so this is what our app looks like now. We've got our form showing. So all we've got to do now is key in the customer number. And we can see there's our uh, little bit of EB script that we banged in saying that when the customer number changed, we wanted to see the number. Um, but notice that the data source has been executed for us automatically. Everything has been filled in for us. Um, and just as an aside, um, the hyperlink, for instance, uh, if we went for email, if I had my integrated email on, um, it would automatically email. And if I um, right click or rather click on the uh, contact here, then I've inherited all the contact information, the queries, contacts, multimedia and so on like that. And there's another example of how App Designer is leveraging the uh, core Cispro product, bringing in the contact object. It knows what it is. Um, and therefore can link to all the other bits and pieces. So in essence, I've hardly done any uh, development at all other than sort of say, well, the data is coming from the business object. I want to put it there. Um, and app designer, please inherit everything else from Cispro. So what we're going to do now is go and add the um, uh, financial info and uh, see a few bits and pieces there. So we need to add our financial info pane. So we'll just click on our form here. And that becomes just exactly the same as before. We'll give it a title. Um, ignore that warning, um, which is great. We'll move it over to the right hand side of our form because that's our spec. Um, and now we need to add our, our fields that we want. So first things first, we're going to pick up the information. We go down to bindings properties, and uh, this is just us selecting the right field. So we go to customer totals and looking at the spec, we want our current uh, balance, 30, 60, 90. Um, and we want current balance and that's the current aging. So that's what we want there. So we'll add those fields. So looking good. Um, and we also uh, want some fields from the header. Um, and I'm just going to sort this into alphabetical sequence. So we want date of last sale, date of last payment, number of outstanding orders, and the outstanding added value. And we can add those as well, which is great. Now, this raises two things. First of all, um, you might have thought that the data source was bound to a particular form. But in fact, we've just, show, I've just shown you that um, the, you can mix and match data from different data sources on the same form. So this first four came from the totals and these last four came from the header. Uh, and if you remember, if we click on one of these fields and look at the field properties, um, App Designer can differentiate between the two because um, the field binding tells it what the data source is and the element name as well. So that's that's great. Now, we do actually have in our spec a requirement to add a couple of group collapsible group headings. So to do that, we go to design form.
and here's our form. And just as an aside, you can go onto any of these and change a variety of, of uh, fields, how to handle numeric numbers, uh, commas, and things like that. We won't bother with any of that at the moment. We're just going to simply add our group headings. One of them was called age debt. There's a group heading, and we'll add that. And the other one was called oops, sales order. Info. And we'll add that. OK, so now we need to move these around into the relevant places. So in our spec, we had um, date of last payment was at the top. So we can just move that to the top, which is great. Um, current balance was next. Um, then uh, it wanted a group heading called age debt under here, which is great. Um, and you sort of think, right, OK, well, now I need to move these current 30, 60, 90 into the age debt. So if I picked up the 90 and tried to move it into age debt, it simply goes above the age debt. And if you try and do it again, nothing will happen. And the problem is that this control at the moment is assuming that I actually, as I'm moving this field around, I'm just moving it up and down um, the list. There's no way of dragging it into that group header at the moment because it that hasn't got any content now the way that we do this is we have to use the keyboard if you show hold the function and the alt key down and use the up arrow when it hits a, a group the first element goes into the group now that the group has got um uh, an, a, a child or an element in it we can now move uh, other fields to it because the control now understands what we're trying to do not only are we moving them in an order um, but we're actually dragging them into uh, a group as well so if we work on that assumption we will um, drag sales order up to here um, we want date of last uh, so sale now what well, i'm actually deliberately doing them in reverse order because as you you see it, it it adds to the top but it doesn't really matter you can just move them around so i'm just going to put number of outstanding orders first i'm going to hold function alt down i'm using the up, upward arrow now we've got the very first element in here um, we can actually use the outstanding order value and the date and so on like that. Now, just to show you that if I wanted to add another field in here, um, then I can key one in. This might be something like Andy test. It might be an alpha field. And if I've already got some groups in here, um, I can actually select them and it will automatically put them in there. So there's a different way of doing that. We won't, I won't bother with that. That's we're not doing not relevant. So we've actually now got our form looking pretty good. So we're going to save and exit. OK, and, and I think what we'll do is we'll run it and just check that it's all working. So uh, we'll press the run command. Save it. OK, that's looking good. So all we've got to do now is add our customer number in here. There's our part, there's our uh, customer message box. All the data is filled in and it looks fantastic. And then you think, oh, hang on a minute. Where's all the information gone for the total section? Um, now, uh, can you remember what we did? Um, in fact, this is to do with um, the firing of the data sequence. And I'd like to say to you that it was a, a deliberate ploy, but I completely forgot to link the um, data source to the um, combo box. So what we'll do is we we'll just close this down. We will go to our combo customer here. And if we come down to the bottom, our data sources. And if you remember, we said when the customer number changed, we wanted to fire the customer header. And that's uh, fine. But we I forgot to say also fire the customer total. So we will apply that. And we will run our app again. Save it. And there we go. So now we've got the data coming from our header 
and also our total. So what we're going to do now is move on and add another pane down here for our list view of invoices. OK, so to add a list view, um, we're going to be using a list view control here. But before we do that, we need to create a data source um, to define where the data is coming for that list view. So we go to data sources again. Um, we'll add a data source. Let's give it a name. Probably something like invoices. Um, the business object type. We want a R S Q R Y business. Now, what we got, what we're doing here now is selecting the node, uh, primary node for the list view um, that represents each row. And on this, on this A R S Q R Y, the invoice detail is the node that repeats itself once for each. Uh, invoice and therefore you're going to get one for each row so we will select that and we will save that now if you're you've watching this part of the course and you happen to have got here um, with uh, missing the introduction part um, i just reiterate there is a full training course on data handling for app designer and covers extensively data sources both business object ones and external SQL ones, along with ADODB and all that sort of thing. So I'm just skipping over here to get you in the getting started mode. So we now have got our data source. We're going to add our list view here. It's great. And we will drag it down here to the bottom. and extend it so first things first let's just quickly change the title ignore that warning um, now uh, this is a slightly different from um, forms what we've got to do is go down to the bottom here and look for bind properties now uh, it, it's sometimes easy to miss um, often um, by default it's collapsed and you might skip over it it's this bind properties we want so first of all what we're saying to the app is what data source uh, where is the list you're going to get its data from well first of all it, what type of data source is it well it's going to be a ob business object data source and once we've said it's that it can look at the list and we're going to pick up the invoices which is great and you can see already that it's actually picked up the primary node that we defined earlier on, which is great. So um, if we go to add columns now, it's um, found our data source, we'll select invoice detail. And if we look at our spec, we want invoice, invoice due, customer PO. Um, we want the invoice balance, the original amount, and we'll put the sales order in. So we'll create the column heads and you can see them all popped in there. Now, if we actually want to have a look at how this has been defined, if we look at the invoice column, for instance, over here, and you've got a list of them here, we'll just look at the invoice. Basically, that's the column we've selected. Currently, it's called, it's caption is invoice, which is fine. It's an alpha, you can change these things. This is the key element here. So we can quite happily change the caption. We could call it Andy if we wanted to, but we must make sure that the XML element it's bound to is the one from the business object. And that's how it how it how it match, matches up. Okay, so we go back to the list view and we come down to the bottom here. The only thing we've got to do now is tell the app when do you want me to fire this business object or this data source rather and to populate this list view so what we're saying is i want to refresh the list view on the following event it's going to be a toolbar executed event fine and it's saying well i've i've got three things on the toolbar here which one is it and we're going to say it's when the customer number changes we want you to fire this um, data source and populate the list view so uh, with a bit of luck and fair wind, that's all we should have to do. So let's save this. And then we will run the app and see what happens. Okay, here we are. So we'll just drag this down a little bit. 
and we'll key our customer number in. And there we are. Uh, relatively straightforward. So with actually um, hardly any VB script at all, in fact, the only useful bit of VB script was the help page that we put right at the beginning, um, you've actually managed to create uh, a customer inquiry program, getting data from the header, the total section, and all the invoices. Um, now, we will move on shortly into uh, being able to click on one of these uh, lines and maybe fire up another uh, modal form with a bit more data in and things like that. So that's going to be the next section. So there's just one final little bit I wanted to show you before we move on, and that was our VB script. Here we are back in our VB script, um, and we've already knocked out our close options and our, our help uh, option button there. Uh, we don't, the Toolbar, uh, the customer combo is actually doing all the data sources automatically, so we actually don't need that. And we certainly don't want a message saying what uh, customer number we are, are in. And before you can blink, we've actually got no running or sensibly running VB script at all. Um, so in fact, what we could do is take that out and we can take all that out. And you can see that despite us um, being able to run queries and data sources on business objects and populate forms and populate list views, uh, we haven't got uh, one line of VB script. In fact, I could take out these events, but we'll probably need them uh, as we move on. So um, it's uh, quite startling just how little uh, code you need to get a reasonably complex program running. Um, okay, let's move on to the next section.